And more and more of God's grace, his mercy, his love, his peace, and his hope fill your hearts and your minds this day. And as Jesus lives in you and as you stay connected to him, may he enable you to love others in the same way that he's loved you. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our living Lord, amen. Over the past weeks of this Easter season here at St. John's, we've been talking in our sermons about the new identity that we have as children of God. Children of God who are loved by God, children of God who are empowered then by his Holy Spirit to believe that and to begin to live the way that God wants us to live as his children. We're moving into the second half of that sermon series today as we begin to think about the the new purpose that God has called us to have as his children who are loved by him and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to begin by considering God's call to us to love others in the same way that he has loved us in our lives. Now, love is a word that gets thrown around pretty casually in our culture. In fact, we talk about love so casually that it often seems like that word has lost its meaning. So we say things like, we love a nice day. I think especially on days like today we say that, right? <laughs> we, uh, we say that we love a good meal. We say that we love a play or a concert that we've gone to see. We say that we love ice cream. At least I know I say that once in a while. People even say they love the Buffalo Bills or Sabres, at least when they're winning. But let them have a couple of bad years, and many fans will stop even thinking about them, let alone saying that they love them anymore. Unfortunately, what happens with the Bills and the Sabres often happens in personal relationships as well. The person we say that we love disappoints us, and then we turn on them. We, we get angry with them. We maybe even try to get even with them. And sometimes the love we had for that person can even turn to hate. As we listen to today's scripture readings, we discovered that hatred may be the clearest evidence that we've lost connection to God and his vine, Jesus Christ. You see, God is love. And his love is revealed through us as we love one another. And therefore, hate cannot come from God. If we find ourselves hating someone, then we've lost our connection to Jesus. Now, we all know too well about the hatred that permeates our world. It's often often hatred that leads to war. It's hatred that leads to terrorism. It's hatred that can often lead to economic oppression or cutthroat competition. It's hatred that leads to divorces. It's hatred that leads to winners and losers. What exactly does it mean to hate someone? It means to fill our heart with a deep desire for harm for that other person. We want them to experience trouble or difficulty in their lives. We want for them to diminish the hurt that we're feeling in ours. Hatred is is a hope that another person's life might be diminished so that ours can be better. And hate's such an easy easy feeling to justify, isn't it? We hate somebody else because they first hated us, we say. We end up doing exactly the opposite of what John tells us happens in the lives of people who felt the love of God. People who know God's love in their life, John says, love because they have first experienced God's love in their own lives. Sometimes we look to our justice system to carry out our feelings of hatred. We've been attacked by someone personally, or we feel attacked by extension when we hear about a a hateful attack that's taken place against people with whom we can identify. And soon we find ourselves beginning to hate that person who's violated our sense of right and wrong, a child molester or a terrorist or a a person who has killed an innocent person. We hear about those people who begin to hate the perpetrator. We expect the justice system to be our instrument, to carry out what we feel that person has has coming to them, what they deserve. The problem is that there's a deadly cycle of hatred that's unleashed in all of that. Reading John's letter helps us to realize 
that our hatred really is not just a result of us being hated by another person. Often that's where we think it starts. And we'd always, and we'd often be really happy to place all of the blame on another person for the hatred that we have in our hearts. But John suggests that hatred is also driven by something that's inside of us, not just that outside person. And the thing that John says that often causes the hatred that comes of us, comes out of our hearts, is fear. Ultimately, John says it's our fear of another person that leads us to direct our hate at that person rather than love. We begin to think that if only justice, as we've decided what that means, happens, if only that person at whom we direct our hatred is punished, then we feel like balance will be restored and we'll be able to move on. We, we hear that so often in, in uh, trials where uh, somebody's been victimized really badly and, we, and they say that, and you hear those people say, if only that person comes to justice, then I'll have balance in my life. I'll be able to move on. Things will be resolved. In the same way, our fear and hatred can cause us to try to silence people we hate as if their demise will bring us life. The problem is that's simply not true. Justice can be carried out and and the hate can still linger. The person can be punished. They can receive justice and we still have the hate in our hearts. Not only does a desire for revenge make us descend into practicing some of the same kind of feelings as the people we hate have for us, but those actions also prevent us from living in the love that Jesus has called us to live. And this cycle of hatred which we keep finding ourselves falling into is a sign that the world in which we live is loveless. At least it's loveless from John's perspective. For it's clear that John is saying that people are loveless if they don't have God's love. And for John, that means not just that we don't love like God loves, but we don't even feel like we're loved by God. Oh, the world certainly does not lack God, even though many in the world may have difficulty locating Him. The world experiences God's justice every day in wars and rumors of wars, in violence and injury and disease and oppression, in dying and death. And whether or not God actually decrees that that kind of pain and suffering should come, many people decide that those things have to be judgment that were sent by God because of the guilt they feel over their own sins. And so they feel like they're experiencing that bad stuff because of what they've done wrong. Is it any wonder that we find ourselves cowering in fear at the signs of evil and terror that are all around us? But John says there's an antidote to this fear. John tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. And he tells us that it's in Jesus that we find that perfect love. In Jesus, the love of God becomes real. In Jesus, that love takes on human flesh and enters human history. Jesus' whole life was a time of living out that love toward people that he met every day. That's what he did every day. No matter what situation they were in, no matter how they came at him, Jesus always lived in love toward them. But beyond that, it was in his atoning sacrifice for our our sins through his death on the cross. That's where Jesus most clearly demonstrated what God's love is all about. On that cross, the cycle of hatred was broken. Jesus hung on that cross. He was being mocked by the people who put him there. He'd been beaten. He'd been beaten down. And yet he did not retaliate against those who hated him. And even more amazing than what he did not do on that cross, namely retaliate with vengeance against the sinner who put his sinless body there. And Jesus could have. He could have called down his angels to destroy them. But even more amazing that he didn't do that was what he did do there. And what he did do there was from that cross show the love of God to the very people who had put him there, us, through our sins. 
On that cross, Jesus overrules the law of reciprocity. On that cross, Jesus took away the old law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. On that cross, Jesus took away the old idea that you do this to me and I get to do that to you. That law which was God's just action against sinners. On that cross, Jesus overruled God's justice with God's love that forgives sinners who don't deserve that kind of grace. Rather than giving sinners what they deserve, the punishment for their sin, which is just, God in Jesus Christ on that cross gives out love, which means he atones for what we've done wrong, so that instead of being guilty before God, we're judged forgiven. That, my friend, is true love. That's not the kind of phony affection that the world calls love. That kind of love that comes from God is a love that's not predicated on what's in it for him. But the love of God is predicated on what's in it for us. And the only way for us to experience that perfect love of God that casts out all of our fears is to stay connected to the vine, Jesus Christ. He offers us the means to be connected to him through his word and the sacraments. That means that as we hear the stories and as we ponder the message of Holy Scripture, the love of Jesus begins to abide in us. It means that as the waters of baptism wash over us, the love of Jesus begins to abide in us. It means that as we eat and drink the very body and blood of Jesus in that bread and wine, the love of Jesus begins to abide in us. And the more diligently we hear that word, the more regularly we remember what he did for us in our baptism, the more regularly we come and eat and drink of the feast that he's given us to eat and drink, the more firmly we are connected to the vine and the more deeply his love will abide in us. What happens when we get connected to that vine is that we who are the branches begin to bear fruit that looks like the vine. Instead of living under the law of hate, we begin to act under the rule of love. When we're connected to the vine and we're bearing that fruit, we break free of our need for retribution that twists our insides and disturbs our minds. And when we're connected to Jesus, instead we find peace in being able to forgive as we have been forgiven. This new identity that we have as children of God that we've been talking about, this new identity we have as children of God who are loved by him each and every day and who are empowered by his Holy Spirit to live like him, this new identity now has a new purpose for living life, a life that is now marked by loving others in the way that Jesus has loved us. Oh, we don't love like Jesus because we've, been, because we've memorized how to do that. We don't love like Jesus because we're compelled to live that way. He tells us we got to do it or else. But we live and love like Jesus by abiding in him and him abiding in us. And his spirit begins to take over our lives. And when that happens, we don't have to stop and think, well, this is the way I'm supposed to act when this happens. Instead, Jesus leads us to be able to reach out in love and forgiveness toward, from, toward those from, who, from whom we have experienced only hate and hurt. Instead of hating because the first in, per, person first hated us, we are able to love them because God, first loved us. And with Jesus abiding in our hearts and abiding in him, we're able to bear much fruit. We can begin to experience true love, and we can begin to practice true love in our families, in our communities, in our church. And so my prayer for you today and for me as well is that as we embrace this new identity that God has given us, as we remember that we are a child who belongs to God. As we remember that we are always loved by him every day in every way. As we remember that he sent his Holy Spirit to live in us 
to help us to live the way he wants us to. My prayer is that you may embrace this new purpose that he has given you, to share his love in every way, every day, with every person that he sends your way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.